Pliny the Elder, The Natural History, translated by Henry T. Riley, 1816-1878, and John Bostock, 1773-1846, first published 1855. Book 1. Preface in the form of a letter, Plinius Secundus to his dear Vespasian, Greeting Most Gracious Highness, let this title, a supremely true one, be yours, while that of most eminent grows to old age with your sire, I have resolved to recount to you, in a somewhat presumptuous letter, the offspring of my latest travail, my volumes of natural history, a novel task for the native muses of your Roman citizens, for twas ever your way, to deem my trifles, something worth. To give a passing touch of polish to my opposite number, you recognize even this service slang, Catullus, for he, as you know, by interchanging the first syllables made himself a trifle harsher than he wished to be considered by his darling Varanuses and Fabuluses, and at the same time that my present sauciness may affect what in the case of another impudent letter of mine lately you complained of as not coming off, that it may result in something getting done, and everyone may know on what equal terms the empire lives with you, you were the triumph to your name and censorial rank, six times consul, colleague in tribune's authority, and, a service that you have made more illustrious than these in rendering it equally to your father and to the equestrian order, commander of his bodyguard, and all this in your public life, and then what a good comrade to us in the companionship of the camp. Nor has fortune's grandeur made any change in you save in enabling you to bestow all the benefit you desire. Consequently as all those methods of paying you reverence are open to everybody else, to me is left only the presumption of treating you with more intimate respect. For that presumption therefore you will debit the responsibility to yourself, and will grant yourself pardon on the score of my offence. I have tried to put on a bold face, and yet have not succeeded, as your grandeur meets me by another route and the rods of office that your genius bears make me move on yet further, in no other person ever radiate more genuinely the dictatorial power of oratory and the tribunician authority of wit. How eloquently you thunder forth your father's praises and your brother's fame! How great you are in the poet's art! O oh mighty fertility of genius, you have contrived a way to imitate your brother also, but who could judge the value of these compositions with confidence when about to submit to the verdict of your talent, especially when that verdict has been invited? For formal dedication of the work to you puts one in a different position from mere publication. In the latter case I could have said, why does your highness read that? It was written for the common herd, the mob of farmers and of artisans, and after them for students who have nothing else to occupy their time, why do you put yourself on the jury? You were not on this panel when I took the contract for this undertaking, I knew you to be too great for me to think you likely to descend to this. Moreover even in the court of learning there is an official procedure for challenging the jury, it is employed even by Marcus Cicero who where genius is in question stands outside all hazard. It may surprise us, but Cicero calls in the aid of counsel, nor yet for the very learned, Manius Perseus I don't want to read this, I want Unius Congus. But if Lucilius, the originator of critical sniffing, thought fit to say this, and Cicero to quote it, especially when writing his theory of the constitution, how much more reason have we to stand on the defensive against a particular juryman? but for my part at the present I have deprived myself of these defences by my nomination, as it matters a great deal whether one obtains a judge by lot or by one's own selection, and one's style of entertainment ranks quite differently with a guest one has invited and one who has offered himself. The candidates in a hotly contested election deposited sums of money with Cato, that resolute foe of corruption, who enjoyed a defeat at the polls as an honour obtained free of charge, and they gave out that they did this in the defense of the highest among human possessions, their innocence. This was the occasion of that famous sigh of Cicero, O oh happy Marcus Portius whom no one dares to ask for something underhand. Lucius Scipio Asiaticus by appealing to the tribunes, one of them being Gracchus, testified that his case could be made good even to an unfriendly judge, in fact a judge whom one chooses oneself one makes the supreme arbiter of one's case, this is the source of the term appeal. You yourself indeed, I know, being placed on the loftiest pinnacle of all mankind, and being endowed with supreme eloquence and learning, are approached with reverential awe even by persons paying a visit of ceremony, and consequently care is taken that what is dedicated to you may be worthy of you. However, country folk, and many natives, not having incense, make offerings of milk and salted meal, 
and no man was ever charged with irregularity for worshipping the gods in whatever manner was within his power. My own presumption has indeed gone further, in dedicating to you the present volumes, a work of a lighter nature, as it does not admit of talent, of which in any case I possessed only quite a moderate amount, nor does it allow of digressions, nor of speeches or dialogues, nor marvellous accidents or unusual occurrences, matters interesting to relate or entertaining to read. My subject is a barren one, the world of nature, or in other words life, and that subject in its least elevated department, and employing either rustic terms or foreign, nay barbarian, words that actually have to be introduced with an apology. Moreover, the path is not a beaten highway of authorship, nor one in which the mind is eager to range, there is not one person to be found among us who has made the same venture, nor yet one among the Greeks who has tackled single-handed all departments of the subject. A large part of us seek agreeable fields of study, while topics of immeasurable abstruseness treated by others are drowned in the shadowy darkness of the theme. Deserving of treatment before all things are the subjects included by the Greeks under the name of encyclic culture, and nevertheless they are unknown, or have been obscured by subtleties, whereas other subjects have been published so widely that they have become stale. It is a difficult task to give novelty to what is old, authority to what is new, brilliance to the commonplace, light to the obscure, attraction to the stale, credibility to the doubtful, but nature to all things and all her properties to nature. Accordingly, even if we have not succeeded, it is honorable and glorious in the fullest measure to have resolved on the attempt. For my own part I am of opinion that a special in learning belongs to those who have preferred service of overcoming difficulties to the of giving pleasure, and I have myself done this in other works also, and I declare that I admire the famous writer Livy when he begins a volume of his history of Rome from the foundation of the city with the words I have already achieved enough of fame, and I might have retired to leisure, did not my restless mind find its sustenance in work. For assuredly he ought to have composed his history for the glory of the world-conquering nation and of the Roman name, not for his own, it would have been a greater merit to have persevered from love of the work, not for the sake of his own peace of mind, and to have rendered this service to the Roman nation and not to himself. As Domitus Piso says, it is not books but storehouses that are needed, consequently by perusing about two thousand volumes, very few of which, owing to the abstruseness of their contents, are ever handled by students, we have collected in thirty-six volumes twenty thousand noteworthy facts obtained from one hundred authors that we have explored, with a great number of other facts in addition that were either ignored by our predecessors or have been discovered by subsequent experience. Nor do we doubt that there are many things that have escaped us also, for we are but human, and beset with duties, and we pursue this sort of interest in our spare moments, that is at night, lest any of your house should think that the night hours have been given to idleness. The days we devote to you, and we keep our account with sleep in terms of health, content even with this reward alone, that, while we are dallying, in Varro's phrase, with these trifles, we are adding hours to our life, since of a certainty to be alive means to be awake. Because of these reasons and these difficulties I dare make no promise, the very words I am writing to you are supplied by yourself. This guarantees my work, and this rates its value, many objects are deemed extremely precious just because of the fact that they are votive offerings. As for your sire, your brother and yourself, we have dealt with you all in a regular book, the history of our own times, that begins where Ophidius's history leaves off. Where is this work? You will inquire. The draft has long been finished and in safe keeping, and in any case it was my resolve to entrust it to my heir, to prevent its being thought that my lifetime bestowed anything on ambition, accordingly I do a good turn to those who seize the vacant position, and indeed also to future generations, who I know will challenge us to battle as we ourselves have challenged our predecessors. You will deem it a proof of this pride of mine that I have prefaced these volumes with the names of my authorities. I have done so because it is, in my opinion, a pleasant thing and one that shows an honorable modesty, to own up to those who were the means of one's achievements, not to do as most of the authors to whom I have referred did. For you must know that when collating authorities I have found that the most professedly reliable and modern writers have copied the old authors word for word, without acknowledgement, not in that valorous spirit of Virgil, for the purpose of rivalry, nor with the candor of Cicero who in his Republic declares himself a companion of Plato, and in his consolation to his daughter says I follow Cranter, 
and similarly as to Panatius in his Duofikis. Volumes that you know to be worth having in one's hands every day, nay even learning by heart. Surely it marks a mean spirit, and an unfortunate disposition to prefer being detected in a theft to repaying a loan, especially as interest creates capital. There is a marvelous neatness in the titles given to books among the Greeks. One they entitled Kappa Eta Rho Omicron Nu, meaning honeycomb, others call their K Rho Alpha Sigma Alpha Mu Alpha Lambda Theta Epsilon Alpha Sigma, i.e. horn of plenty, so that you can hope to find a draft of hen's milk in the volume, and again violets, muses, cold alls, handbooks, meadow, tablet, impromptu titles that might tempt a man to forfeit his bail. But when you get inside them, good heavens, what a void you will find between the covers. Our authors being more serious use the titles Antiquities, Instances, and Systems, the wittiest, talks by lamplight, I suppose because the author was a toper, indeed Tipolo was his name. Varro makes a rather smaller claim in his satires a Ulysses and a half and folding tablet. Diodorus among the Greeks stopped playing with words and gave his history the title of library. Indeed the philologist Oppian, the person whom Tiberius Caesar used to call the world's symbol, though he might rather have been thought to be a drum, advertising his own renown, wrote that persons to whom he dedicated his compositions received from him the gift of immortality. For myself, I am not ashamed of not having invented any livelier title. And so as not to seem a downright adversary of the Greeks, I should like to be accepted on the lines of those founders of painting and sculpture who, as you will find in these volumes, used to inscribe their finished works, even the masterpieces which we can never be tired of admiring, with a provisional title such as worked on by Apelles or Polyclitus, as though art was always a thing in process and not completed. So that when faced by the vagaries of criticism the artist might have left him a line of retreat to indulgence, by implying that he intended, if not interrupted, to correct any defect noted. Hence it is exceedingly modest of them to have inscribed all their works in a manner suggesting that they were their latest, and as though they had been snatched away from each of them by fate. Not more than three, I fancy, are recorded as having an inscription denoting completion, made by so and so, these I will bring in at their proper places, this made the artist appear to have assumed a supreme confidence in his art, and consequently all these works were very unpopular. For my own part I frankly confess that my works would admit of a great deal of amplification, and not only those now in question but also all my publications, so that in passing I may ensure myself against your scourges of Homer, that would be the more correct term, as I am informed that both the Stoics and the Academy, and also the Epicureans, as for the philologists, I always expected it from them, are in travail with a reply to my publications on philology and for the last ten years have been having a series of miscarriages, for not even elephants take so long to bring their offspring to birth. But as if I didn't know that Theophrastus, a mortal whose eminence as an orator won him the title of the divine, actually had a book written against him by a woman, which was the origin of the proverb about choosing your tree to hang from. I am unable to refrain from quoting the actual words of Cato the censor applying to this, to show that even the treatise on military discipline of Cato, who had learnt his soldiering under Africanus, or rather under him and Hannibal as well, and had been unable to endure even Africanus, who when commander-in-chief had won a triumph, found critics ready for it of the sort that try to get glory for themselves by running down another man's knowledge. What then? He says in the book in question, I myself know that if certain writings are published there will be plenty of people to quibble and quarrel, but mostly people quite devoid of true distinction. For my part I have let these persons' eloquence run its course. Plancus also put it neatly, when told that Asinius Pollio was composing declamations against him, to be published by himself or his children after Plancus's death, so that he might be unable to reply, only phantoms fight with the dead. This remark dealt those declamations, such a nasty blow that in cultivated circles they are thought the most shameless things extant. Accordingly, being safeguarded even against quibble quarrelers, Cato's nickname for them, a neat compound word, for what else do these people do but quarrel or seek a quarrel? We will follow out the remainder of our intended plan. As it was my duty in the public interest, to have consideration for the claims upon your time, I have appended to this letter a table of contents of the several books, and have taken very careful precautions to prevent your having to read them. 
you by these means will secure for others that they will not need to read right through them either, but only look for the particular point that each of them wants, and will know where to find it. This plan has been adopted previously in Roman literature, by Valerius Sorinus in his books entitled Lady Initiates.